papers, evidence, and practice is sort of what PEP is supposed to mean. And you have probably uh, all seen sort of a hierarchy of like this that describes the levels of evidence. And we've just heard uh, from Amit about a, uh, an RCT. And um, we're going to hear from Dave shortly about a case control kind of study. But I thought I would run the spectrum today. And uncharacteristically, I would go to the bottom and do a, a review article. So the review article that I selected to do is this from the May 23rd edition of the New England Journal, uh, Mechanisms of Acute Coronary Syndrome and Their Implications for Therapy. It's part of their Mechanisms of Disease um, series. And review articles we don't generally kind of emphasize, but every now and then a review article comes along that I think really we should all pay attention to. And this is probably um, the best review article I've seen that impacts emergency medicine um, this year. Peter Libby is from Harvard in Boston, and um, uh, he's one of the leaders in sort of some of the basic science around atherosclerosis. And the reason I selected this paper is because as I talk to students and residents and as I hear physicians interacting, um, I just came to the conclusion that we need to kind of update our cognitive model um, about coronary artery disease and in particular ACS. We spend a lot of our time, a lot of our cognitive energy looking at, considering and trying to work through ACS. And I'm not sure that we all have sort of an up-to-date understanding of what the disease is that we're actually looking at. And as we talk about things like stress testing, as Ram did in his last uh, talk, um, there's a lot of, um, I think, misunderstanding about the disease that we pay so much attention to. So I thought this was a very important article to look at. Now, Peter Libby starts out his review by making this observation that coronary atherosclerosis is a very slowly progressive condition, often over decades, whereas ACS is, is usually very abrupt. Um, and what is the mechanism that explains the sudden change from a stable condition, or in many cases an asymptomatic coronary disease, to sudden cardiac death, or a STEMI, or a non-STEMI? What is it that suddenly, and usually very abruptly happens, that makes somebody who has no symptoms at all arrest? In the traditional model that a lot of people seem to carry around in their head, their cognitive model, is that you have a coronary artery and that over time you develop this plaque. Cholesterol, lipids, this thing grows, grows and grows over time. And it, it, you know, it starts to fill up the lumen and over time you get a narrowed lumen that results in flow restriction during activity and you get symptoms. Angina. Um, and that this, this flow restriction can sometimes get to the point where it's so small that just a little platelet kind of thrombus plugs it and you get a STEMI. If it doesn't completely plug it, maybe you get an end STEMI. Maybe it plugs it for a while and then it you know, dislodges and you people get unstable angina or they get a little troponitis and they you know, get better and nothing on the ECG. So you have critical stenosis that easily gets plugged and that is the sort of traditional, what I call the plumbing model of how we think about coronary disease. And so because of that, a lot of our traditional diagnostic and therapeutic approaches uh, focus on stenosis. So we do angiograms looking for critical stenosis. We do PCI and cabbage to try and move that blockage and return the flow. Uh, we do stress testing and nuclear perfusion scans to try and detect flow limiting obstruction. So people get symptoms when they go on the treadmill because the stenosis is so tight they can't get the blood through. But what do we know? We know from autopsy studies that most fatal events due to, um, most fatal events, coronary events, are due to disruption of the coronary artery plaques, not to critical stenosis. The majority of people who arrest at autopsy and you look at the coronary arteries, they don't have critical stenosis. They have plaque disruption. What do we know from clinical trials? Treating stenosis does not reduce coronary events. We know from recent studies looking at coronary ultrasound and CT scanning of the coronary arteries that luminal stenosis is a very late manifestation of coronary artery disease. 
And in clinical practice, we know that when we take people to the cath lab to PCI them for their STEMIs, when you get rid of that clot, oftentimes it's, there's not a critical stenosis there where that thrombus occurred. There's a study that was just published last year, actually a Greek study, um, where they actually manually aspirated the thrombus during a STEMI, and in 30% of the cases, the stenosis was less than 50%. So clearly a non-critical stenosis. So what's going on here? For non-ACS non patients, for not STEMIs, not for unstable anginas, PCI does not appear to improve mortality or the risk of MI in the future. This is from his paper. Peter Libby says, clinical data acquired during the current era of medical management of atherosclerosis has affirmed that invasive procedures for the treatment of stenosis generally do not prevent future thrombotic events more effectively than non-invasive treatments. A lot of people appreciate that. A lot of people don't know that. We spend so much energy and time um, trying to deal with stenosis. If you go to the NNT site by David Newman's site, he actually puts coronary stenting for non-acute coronary disease compared to medical therapy alone as black. And black means harm. He says that 50 people are harmed from cath complications and nobody benefits. There's no reduction in MIs in the future. He actually goes as far as to say there's no help for lessening of anginal symptoms, which many papers would kind of dispute. And this is all based on a very large um, uh, meta-analysis which was published last year. There is some dispute about this, but it's, there are many papers that show there's no benefit to PCI in non-acute coronary syndromes. It does not prevent thrombosis. So he goes on to say, this assemblage of clinical data challenges our traditional view of the pathogenesis of acute coronary syndromes, which ascribes a leading role to critically stenotic lesions. Sizable plaques can reside in the walls of affected arteries without being detected on arteriograms and without issuing any warning to the patient or the physician. If you think about most of the patients that you see that have STEMIs, they're just sitting there watching TV and all of a sudden have crushing chest pain and diaphoresis and come in. They don't give you a story. Well, you know, for the last week I've had all this pain. That's an uncommon. Most times it's sudden. Many of these patients are asymptomatic. They've never been diagnosed with coronary disease. The recent introduction of, of intracoronary ultrasound gives us, starts to give us a very good idea of what's going on. Here's the angiogram, which really looks relatively unimpressive. This is a normal coronary artery. There's a 3 millimeter lumen. There's a 3.1 millimeter lumen. Look at this huge plaque. What we are learning is that the beginning of atherogenesis, this plaque which starts to form, there's a, uh, the, the artery wall starts to uh, accommodate. And actually, it doesn't, as most people think, start here and then start to encroach on the lumen. It actually pushes the arterial wall out. And these, these plaques grow and grow and grow without causing much luminal obstruction at the beginning. And it's these kind of lesions. This is an extreme example where there's sort of a normal lumen. Many people have coronary disease, but it's not critical. 50%, 60%, something like that. But what we see is they have these huge vulnerable plaques that don't interfere with the luminal flow. Here, in just uh, a depiction of some of the types of mechanisms that lead to coronary disease. You have these very lipid-rich plaques that rupture and you get a thrombosis. We have these other sort of plaques that just have erosions and develop a thrombosis, intra-plaque intra hemorrhages. And this is the more traditional thing that we think of, where you've got all of this huge plaque with a stenotic lesion. Peter Libby in his article spends a lot of time, a couple of pages, talking about plaque rupture. Because most people who have a STEMI or who die, it's related to plaque rupture. So plaque rupture is identified as the major cause of MI at autopsy studies. Um, the strongest predictor of plaque rupture is the thin fibrous cap. And they've spent a lot of research looking at this. Um, and collagen is the key determinant of the fibrous cap strength. So if you think about it, you've got a plaque. There's a very thin cap over that. And what happens at that level on the cap is what determines whether the plaque ruptures. It's not related to the luminal stenosis. 
What determines how, how good that, that fibrin cap is, is collagen. That's what gives the integrity of the cap. And so when we look at um, people who have had plaque rupture, they can find these huge concentrations of T cells, macrophages, and all kinds of inflammatory products. Plaque rupture is now felt to be an inflammatory condition. It's not a plumbing issue. It's not like you know, benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's not a, just a mechanical issue. There is clearly an inflammatory basis to plaque rupture. In fact, um, this is from his article, and he shows two sort of areas of, of research and interest. One is here with decreased collagen production. Collagen comes from smooth muscle cells. And T cells with this interferon product seem to interfere with the production of collagen, which makes the fiber and cap weak, which makes it prone to rupture, which causes thrombosis. Or there's increased collagen degradation related to the macrophages. They produce these proteases, which start to break down the collagen, making them weak. They make less collagen, they get weaker collagen, it ruptures, you get a thrombosis, you get an MI. And it's all related to these T cells and some of these inflammatory products. Plaque erosion, which we know less about, is related to a denuding of the endothelial lining. It's not rupture, it doesn't expose the plaque, it just denudes the endothelial cells so that they become a little bit sticky with platelets. There are not a lot of inflammatory cells there when you look at them. There's not a lot of T cells and macrophages in these, and they account for about 20% of MIs. Erosions, not ruptures. We know less about these. This is from his article as well. This is what we were talking about. You have this large lipid pool, a lot of inflammatory cells, lots of macrophages, lots of T cells infiltrating this plaque. The very thin fibrin cap bursts. The collagen you get weeks, it ruptures and it exposes all this thrombogenic material to the lumen and you get a big thrombosis and you develop a STEMI. You can see here, depicted, that the, it, it accommodates this plaque. And the lumen is not critically stenotic. But when you get a rupture and you get thrombosis occurring, you get a STEMI. This is an erosion. These things are not sort of lipid rich. They're relatively non-inflammatory. But there's some mechanism that denudes the lining, and that triggers a thrombotic event, and you get luminal occlusion. This is sort of the traditional view, but look at this fibrin cap. It's thick. Over time and over decades, some people, we don't really completely understand, start to develop this very thick fibrin cap. That thing's not going to rupture. These people get angina. You get calcification, it's very stable, there's no inflammatory cells. They go through their whole life, maybe asymptomatic, or never have a coronary event, even though they have lots and lots of atherosclerosis. Why do some people get an inflammatory response that leads to rupture and STEMI, sometimes at young ages in non-stenotic um, uh, plaques? We don't really understand. So um, future implications here. ACS diagnostic testing may begin to include biological markers of inflammation. There is some research about using high sensitivity CRP for, for this, but it doesn't, hasn't really panned out in, in ACS. But I think that in the future, we will start to develop markers which will identify high levels of inflammation along with the right clinical setting may suggest ACS. Therapy directed at inflammatory and vascular targets. Can you imagine using things like methotrexate, some of the monoclonal antibodies directed at T cells that may be a therapy for um, ACS? Therapy to stabilize the plaque and the cap. Are there molecules, are there treatments that can increase the strength of the fibrin cap that can affect collagen as opposed to affecting platelets? The role of statin therapies is, a, he talks about it in his article, but people know that um, statins don't just affect lipids, they seem to increase the integrity of the plaque and stabilize the plaque out of proportion to any changes in the size of the plaque. The plaques usually don't change size with uh, statins, but they become more stable. And improved cross-sectional imaging techniques may give us a better idea as far as diagnosis goes. So from emergency medicine perspective, some implications of all of this. The first thing I think that we should understand is that ACS has multiple mechanisms. 
to go from coronary disease to, to um, ACS. The most common one is rupture, but erosions and some of the other uh, mechanisms, which, and they all seem to be different. Some are inflammatory, some of them aren't. Some of them have different, uh, they have a different mechanism, so it's not just one mechanism. Um, put critical stenosis in perspective. Many of our patients have critical stenosis, they have angina. Lots of people who have STEMIs and ACS, when you angiogram, they do have stenosis, 70%, 80%. But I think we have to put critical stenosis in its place and appreciate it is not the most common cause of what we see. The presentation demographics and risk factors, which I didn't go into at all, are different for the different mechanisms. So we need to maintain a broad sort of um, picture of our patients. And the other thing, which I think is very important and what sort of prompted me to be so interested in this area, is that how many of you have seen somebody who comes in with a STEMI who's had a normal stress test, right? Who's seen that? We've all seen that. How many people have had a recent angiogram which showed no critical stenosis and is in your eMERGE with a big STEMI and big anterior ST elevations? We've all seen that. So why is that? And the reason that is true is because you don't need a critical stenosis. You don't need flow-limiting stenosis in order to be at risk for ACS and, th and, and sudden thrombosis. And we should keep this in mind. I've been in several fights with the CCU residents about having to admit people, and they say, well, you know, they had an angiogram you know, four months ago, it looked reasonable. That doesn't matter, right? Most people have STEMI, have thrombosis at a location that does not have critical stenosis. So um, I just wanted to quickly go through that. I think this is a really important article for emergency medicine. It brings some basic science, and hopefully we can all sort of in our own minds have a cognitive sort of model of what ACS is like um, that's going to evolve over time, but puts a major um, focus on inflammatory um, biochemical causes of ACS as opposed to mechanical causes. I think ACS is going to turn out to be more like rheumatoid arthritis and less like BPH. Thank you.